Karthik Singh, I'm a senior. I'm Herschel Shaft, I'm a junior. I mean, our shot, I'm senior. I'm a DT of the law, I'm a junior. On the judging panel, I am Karen Bliss, an assistant professor uh, at Virginia Military Institute. I'm Dan Connors, I work at IBM Research. I'm Kelly Black, I'm from the Medics at the University of Georgia. Amanda Bassin with the National Bar Service. Chris Bergman, and an associate analyst at the Semester Service. You guys will have 15 <coughs> minutes to do your presentation. When you have two minutes remaining, I will signal you. Um, after that, we'll have some questions from the panel of judges, and then we'll be done. We go ahead and get started when you're ready. All right, so as we said, we're from Western Academy, and we're going to be talking about our solution to from G C to shiny C. Uh, obviously, there's three parts to a solution, so uh, let's start the first part. So in part one of the problem, our goal is to assess the potential future effects of sea level changes for each of the five given national parks. And we did this by developing a sea level change risk rating model. Um, so it was sort of obvious to us that the most direct threat posed by sea level change uh, is permanent flooding of coastal areas. And so we developed our model around that idea. Um, so essentially, our risk rating for some in, uh, coastal park at a time t years after 2016 is defined as the percentage of the park that was above ground in 2016 that is now at the time t below sea level. And sort of visually, that's what our model looks like. Mathematically, that is our model. So the next sort of issue that we have to tackle is how do we determine how much of the park is flooded at the time t? So to do that, we use a submodel here, which really just boils down to length times width. Uh, in this case, the length is the length of the coastline of the national park. Uh, and then the width is the inland penetration of the ocean at time t. So the c there, uh, again, length, the d times x of t, that is sort of the only width. x of t is the uh, sea level change uh, sort of uh, I guess model, which we seem to be linear for each arc. So to find how, how far inland the ocean penetrates, we use an assumption. And we uh, essentially, what we assert is that the distance inland penetrated by the ocean is directly proportional to the rise in sea level. And we can do this because we assume that every national park has a coastline that's sloped at a 0.07% grade. And that uh, figure is an average of data we obtained from the USGS or US uh, coastal uh, grades. Um, and so as it turns out, by our model, uh, a simple proportion just tells us that a one millimeter increase in sea level corresponds to a 1.4 meter increase in inland penetration, which we convert to miles to make the units work. Um, so these are our results. We ran our model on each of the five parks for each three given time periods. And uh, one thing you'll note, Kenai Fjords is sort of unusual there in that its risk rating is zero all across the board. Uh, that was the reason for that was Kenai Fjords National Park. Uh, our data showed that it was the only park that had a negative rate of sea level change, and that does not correspond to risk uh, in our model, and that is reflected as such. Um, so to categorize by low, medium, and high, uh, what we did, we just took the 15 data points and we took the top, middle, and bottom uh, one third or thirds of that data, and then we set those equal low, medium, and high. Uh, ideally, what we could have done, maybe as improvement, is to run the risk rating on all uh, coastal national parks so we have a larger sample size, and that way the percentiles would probably make much more sense. Um, but that is what we did. Um, now, as for the question of whether our model stands up to, I guess, the 100-year test, We'd say probably not, and the reason is because our model hinges upon the assumption that sea level change is linear, um, and that's really not an assumption that stands up for 100 years, simply because climate change and sea level change are really driven by human factors which are just impossible to predict over a 100 year uh, span. So in terms of validating a model, we took a look at the extremes that our uh, risk rating model produced. So on the left here, we have Cape Hatteras, which if you recall had the highest risk rating, about I think 23% after 50 years. And geographically, I guess visually, this makes sense. Cape Hatteras is small in area, but the relative coastline is quite large, as it's pretty much just surrounded by water, uh, which is reflected in the high risk rating. As opposed to something like Kenai Fjords, uh, even with a negative um, sea level change rate, Kenai Fjords is much larger in area, and therefore the coastline, I guess, is uh, smaller relative to that larger area. And that is reflected in its lower risk rating. And to cap off the section, we did a quick sensitivity analysis for uh, Acadia National Park in this case. And we just wanted to see if changing the rate of uh, change of sea level by small amounts drastically affect the um, risk rating 
which it really doesn't. Again, the categories are a little bit skewed because of our small sample size, but numerically the risk ratings stay uh, pretty consistent, which is good. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Herschel for part two. So part two, we were tasked with coming up with an overall vulnerability score for each of the five national parks. And we took into account three factors. Those were sea level rise, hurricanes, and wildfires. And because these are all very different climate-related events, we needed some way to compare between these different factors. And the way we did that was by looking at the expected damage that each one would cause in a given year. In addition, we normalized these expected damages on a per acre basis by dividing by the total area of the park so that we get uh, a vulnerability score that is in dollars per acre. Then we sum the three outputs of our sum models to get our overall vulnerability index. So starting with sea level rise. Our sea level rise hinged on, on the results from part one. We took the percent of the park that was impacted by sea level rise, multiplied it by the area, and then multiplied it by an estimate of parkland value, which was around $1,200. Um, we then normalized by dividing by the area to get these results. We found that just as in part one, Cape Hatters was the most vulnerable to sea level of change, while Ken I Fjords had almost no vulnerability. Actually, it had no vulnerability to sea level rise. We took a fairly similar approach for wildfires. We multiplied the expected number of acres burned in a given year by the estimated damage per acre. We estimated that damage per acre to be around $320 based on historical wildfire damage data. The expected number of acres burned was modeled using a linear regression because, as you can see here, they, it did have a positive trend. Now, Canada Fjords, which is in Alaska, we assumed to have no wildfires simply because there was no data available and um, it's in Alaska. Right? In Acadia and Cape Hatteras, we could look at the data and see that there was almost no wildfires in that area. Um, and, and so it was basically insignificant in the grand scheme of our model. Padre Island and Olympic National Park uh, did have positive trends in their uh, wildfire frequencies and the number of acres burned by wildfires. And we modeled that using the regression after taking a moving average and moving to wildfires. And once we extrapolated into the future and normalized based on the total area of each park, we were able to find that Padre Island was by far the most vulnerable to wildfires. I'll turn it over to Nihar for the hurricane somehow. Hi, so with hurricanes, we had to deal with um, a few challenges that were different from the previous two submodels. And so basically the thing with hurricanes is that they come in categories of different likelihood and severity, categories one through five um, for hurricanes. So basically what we wanted to do to calculate uh, the expected damage from hurricanes for a given year shown by the formula on the top, um, which was take the severity of the hurricane measured in damage per acre of a category K hurricane, that's okay, times the expected number of that category hurricanes which were projected to occur in a given year in that park. And then over 50 years, we just sum those uh, yearly expected damages to get a total value after 50 years. So calculating S sub K, um, or the damage per acre of a category K storm, actually turned out to be fairly difficult because there's very little data that we found available on actually how much damage is caused by hurricanes to rural areas such as national parks. There's a lot of data available about the damage hurricanes cause to urban areas such as cities. But we did not think that that data was at all transferable to rural areas because obviously it's going to be order of magnitudes higher where you have more development and more human activity. Um, so because the, the data was uh, very limited, we had to make reasonable assumptions. Um, and so basically we assumed certain dollar values uh, for damages and then uh, those dollar values decreased linearly um, as the categories of the storm um, were, were weaker as well. So in terms of calculating L sub K, which is the expected number of hurricanes, uh, or category K hurricanes, which are gonna occur in a given year, we actually use a Poisson distribution. And so Poisson distribution was perfect because it gives a probability of a given number of events occurring in a fixed time interval. And so here we actually needed to calculate a given, uh, given number of hurricanes that are gonna occur in a fixed time interval, which was yearly. Um, so first, before we use the model, we wanted to check all the assumptions um, to make sure that it was actually valid. So the first assumption is that the events have to occur independently, which hurricanes do occur independently. There are also discrete events. They're, they don't happen continuously. And um, hurricane frequencies will stay approximately constant, and that's um, data that we got from a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration research study which suggested that there's no data to suggest that hurricane frequencies are going to change um, as of now in the long term. 
So in terms of the in terms of the math, um, the formula on the, on the right is the actual Poisson distribution formula. Um, so basically, it's used to calculate the probability as, as written here that exactly x category k hurricanes occur in a given year. And so to find the expected number of category k hurricanes that are going to occur in a given year, which is L sub k and goes into the model from a few slides ago, is really just an expected value into infinity of um, the probabilities outputted by the, the formula on the right. Um, and so that's how we calculated the expected number of category k storms which are going to occur in a given year. So crunching all the numbers, um, we found uh, the following vulnerabilities to hurricanes. And so you can see that um, Padre Island and Cape Hatteras um, are going to have the highest vulnerability. And just uh, logically and intuitively, that makes a lot of sense because those two are in Hurricane Alley, um, North Carolina, and the Gulf Coast of Texas, um, whereas the other ones are in, uh, in, in more safety uh, as, it rigor as it relates to hurricanes. Um, and then finally, summing all those three submodels together for part two, we came up with our total vulnerability index which is shown here, and it's broken down by the different types of uh, climate-related events that we're looking at. Um, so you can see here that, for example, Padre Island has the highest vulnerability um, because it's affected by sea level rise, hurricanes, and wildfires, so it gets that triple whammy. Um, so now I'll hand it off to Aditya, who's going to talk about part three. All right, so for part three, let, let nature take its course. We are focused on predicting the long-term visitorship and coastal parks. So we decided to consider three major factors in our model. The first one was the mean annual temperature in the area around the park. The next one was the population of the US. And the third one was the vulnerability index. For the first two factors, the temperature and the population, we actually used data from the previous 20 years and performed a linear regression to predict the population of the temperature 50 years in the future. For the vulnerability index, we assumed to be constant over time. Now we really wanted to look at how each of these individual factors affected visitorship in the parks. So our model's choice was a multivariate linear regression model. So here's our model or our hypothesis function. Uh, the parameter vector theta, which consists of m0, m1, m2, and m3 here. Uh, m1, m2, and m3 are the feature coefficients of the relative weights of each of the factors. x1, x2, and x3 are the factors themselves, the population, the temperature, and the vulnerability index. And uh, m0 is really just an intercept term. So the way that we determine the values for m1, m2, and m3 was we actually optimized them for the mean squared error cost function j of theta as seen here. So what we actually did is we uh, took data for the five target parks uh, from the past 20 years, and then we uh, our y would be the actual visitorship of the parks in those 20 years, and our predicted outputs uh, based on the three factors that we input would be our hypothesis, and then based on that, we trained it on the 20 years and then predicted uh, using the inputs from the regression for 50 years in the future. And here are the results we got. As you see here, that at the top is our predicted visitorship equation. Uh, the uh, signs for the temperature and the vulnerability co coefficients match what we would expect. As temperature goes up in general, we would expect more people to go outdoors so they would be attending more parks. And the vulnerability index, as a park becomes more vulnerable to climate change and loses assets, we would expect less visitorship. Uh, the population coefficient sign doesn't exactly match what we would expect. We would think that as population increases, more people visit parks. And that's due to some of the limitations that we'll discuss in the next slide. One thing also to note here is that we can't really analyze the relative magnitudes of the coefficients, and the reason for that is because we did not normalize this data prior to inputting it into our model. So final results, we see that Ken IQRs had one of the biggest increases in vis visitorship, both more than four times in 50 years from now. And for our projected counts, Padre Island uh, almost half in visitorship, so uh, we would see that that's the most significant decrease. So a limitation that I was alluding to in the previous slide, uh, one of the things to note is that for the two factors, the temperature and the population, we did use extrapolated data because we predicted using a linear regression. So this very well could have reduced the accuracy in our model. However, given the time constraints that we had at the time uh, of the competition, it made the most sense to do it. Another thing to note is that the original intent of this multivariate regression model was that we wanted to have a general model which could be applied to any coastal park. And what we did is we actually ended up using absolute visitorship data while uh, using this, while training this general model. So as you can see here, for example, with Acadia and Ken I. George National Parks, uh, the visitorship counts aren't really comparable. They're not necessarily on the same order of magnitude. So a better option in developing a general model would have been to use a uh, relative visitorship, such as a percent change in visitorship, instead of absolute visitorship. Another option would have been to use uh, individual models for each of the parks so that we would not have this issue. So final recommendations, our basic principle here is that as visitorship uh, increases in the national park, we would recommend that the NPS uh, allocate more funds there. 
So, uh, you know, money can't really solve climate change uh, after a certain extent. So we would suggest that Kenai Fjords, which would have the uh, largest uh, projected increase in visitorship, be uh, allocated the most funds, and Padre Island, which would have the most significant decrease, we would recommend that the National Park Service not uh, really spend that much of their funds there. So I'll conclude to thank the Moody's Foundation for uh, hosting this competition, SIA for organizing the event, and our coach, Mrs. Gardner, for all of her guidance. So in question one, uh, the values for uh, the Kenai National Park were lowered at zero percent. Yes. Um, do you think that ne uh, significant negative sea level changes should be considered, um, given that sometimes national parks also incorporate coastal and aquatic biodiversity as well as terrestrial biodiversity? Right. So um, that's a very good point. Uh, in our model, we obviously we sort of simplify demonstrating we mainly focus on asset loss, uh, most of our models are focused on money. So that's uh, not something that we could consider um, in terms of, and you do bring up the point, that's just not something we considered. Uh, moving forward, uh, I think we're creating a more nuanced risk rating for factors that definitely include something like that, and I would definitely uh, reflect on the results. So. Um, there was an integral that appeared in the presentation that I don't think that we saw in the paper. Do you have an idea of which slide? Um, it was the integral from zero to infinity. Uh, uh, yeah. Uh, that, yeah, that's the nation there. And then there was an integral somewhere after that? Uh, I, don't, I don't think we used yeah. after that, did you say? OK, maybe that's true. Yeah, um, the thing with, we, I don't think we did use any integrals. And the main reason is we okay. were dealing with discrete Function, so we didn't. Um, okay. So, uh, oh, but then this was something that then, then you were talking about. Okay. Uh, yeah. Could you unpack this for me one more time? Sure. There's yeah, an X, okay. and then there's a yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, basically, what we wanted to do here was that the formula e p sub k gives the probability of the e p sub k of x gives the probability that x category k storms are going to occur in every given year. So, e p sub one of one is going to be the probability that one category one hurricane occurs in a given year. So we find all those probabilities that one category one hurricane will occur, two category one hurricanes will occur, three category one hurricanes will occur, and then we uh, we find you know one times the probability that one will occur, two times the probability that two hurricanes will occur, and then we use that to find an expected value, which would be the expected number of hurricanes that we expect to occur. Got it. Okay, I was having I was thinking about that and then we was bothering you. That makes sense. Now. Okay. okay, thank you. A couple of, on figure two in your report, you were giving R squared values for some of these uh, lines here, right. that page. Uh, but they just seem to be out of whack. That, that uh, our Olympic were very low, but the line looks like it fits the data. And then Padre Island, the values for R squared were very high, and they didn't look like they fit the line. So can you explain that? Yeah, so if you look at the next page, which is figure three, after removing two outliers from the data for Olympic, um, the R squared value jumps up quite a bit. And, and so after removing those two outliers, we were able to fit a, a fairly good linear model to the data. The other question I had, you have a picture there, you said that the average grade of uh, the coastal is 0 0.07 percent. Right. That's an incredibly small angle. Yeah. So that would mean like uh, in your, your calculation you said a one millimeter increase goes in fourteen hundred millimeters. Then. Yes. That's right. All right. So if, I, if I'm at Cape Hatteras swimming on the beach, mm -hmm. you have a one foot wave, how far will that go in? Quite a bit. Fourteen hundred feet. Right. That just seems not possible. Yeah. And that is certainly a limitation in our model. Um, that was sort of a quick simplification we did. Um, I mean, our results, uh, when we were looking at our results, they seemed reasonable, but I mean, bringing that up, that is quite an issue. Uh, ideally, we would get coastal grade information for each individual. What, what was the source of that 0.07? Uh, we had a data sheet from Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, uh, so USGS. So that was basically just a list of coastal grades. Okay. 
Yeah. Which yeah. is the average. Yeah. It's possible yeah. that we interpret the data wrong, but that's the data that we have. Yeah, and, and as Karthik mentioned, it would probably be more ideal to specifically for each national park um, get the average coastal grade for that national park. Um, but given the time constraints that we were dealing with, we just decided that this would be a, a, a reasonable simplification to move forward. So you, you note that the population effect on visitorship mm -hmm. uh, is in the wrong is of the wrong sign. Mm -hmm. um, with more time, what would you try to do to change to get the right direction on that? Yeah. So uh, two of the improvements we had there. One was because implemented the uh, multivariate regression model as we did, and instead used a, for example, percent change in visitor count when we were training our data. So instead of using the direct visitorship count, if we had used, for example, percent changes. Uh, we would have most likely gotten a better result because it's difficult for the model to really account for differences in visitorship because some of the parks are uh, really different magnitudes as you can see here. Another option would have just been to uh, run a model in on each individual park. Thanks.